skies Let it resound loud as the rolling sea Sing a song full of a faith that the dark past has taught us Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us Facing the rising sun of our new day begun Let us march on till victory is one stony the road we tried bitter the chasting rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died yet with a steady To the place for which I fought the side. We have come over away with the tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of a bright star is cast God of our weary years God of our silent tears Thou who has brought us thus far on On our way Thou who has by Thy might led Forever in the path we pray Lest our feet stray from the places our God Where we met thee Lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world We forget thee Shadow beneath thy hand May we forever stand True to our God True to our day To What a wonderful way to start the program. Thanks to Latasha Brown for that uplifting, stirring rendition of the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. It is a song that was written as a poem by James Weldon Johnson in 1900 and set to music by his brother, John Rosamond Johnson, for Abraham Lincoln's birthday in 1905. In 1919, the NAACP dubbed it the Negro National Anthem for its power in voicing a cry for liberation and affirmation for African-American people. The song is a prayer of thanksgiving for faithfulness and freedom 
with imagery evoking the biblical exodus from slavery to the freedom of the promised land. It is featured in 39 different Christian hymnals and it is sung in churches across the United States and beyond. Certainly over the past few months, we have been lifting our voice to sing and shout and lifting our fists and our feet in the streets to protest and march against structural and systemic racism and, and, knee, and the knee that has been kept on our necks for centuries. My name is Gerald Lenoir, and I'm a strategy analyst at the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley. The Othering and Belonging Institute belong, brings together researchers and organizers, stakeholders and communicators and policymakers to identify and eliminate the barriers to an inclusive, just, and sustainable society in order to create transformative change. We are a diverse and vibrant hub generating work centered on realizing a world where all belong, where belonging entails being respected at a level that includes the right to contribute and make demands upon society and political and cultural institutions. We're very honored and exciting to have as co-sponsors of, of this event, the Black Voters Matter Fund. This event is the third in a series of live stream events initiated by the Othering and Belonging Institute titled Rise Up for Justice, Black Lives and Our Collective Future. It is providing space for cutting edge conversations among activists, scholars, journalists, lawyers, and other thought leaders to provide context and analysis on this transformative moment and to envision what comes next in the movement for racial justice. The Black-led movement demanding police accountability and justice has galvanized anger, grief, and frustration over the repeated killings of Black men and women, both historically and the present day. And we just got the word that the grand jury has indicted only one officer in the Breonna Taylor murder. And so we know that the struggle continues. But this movement has also galvanized hope for a future rooted in true belonging. People worldwide are participating in this pivotal moment and uh, will will hopefully reshape not only our society's relationship with black communities, but also our collective future. Today's theme is voter suppression and and the fight to vote. 50 years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the right to vote is being subverted by domestic and foreign actors, federal and state governments, counties and courts. The fight to vote has taken on legal advocacy and grassroots organizing dimensions in many parts of the country. This Rise Up for Justice live stream discussion brings together some of the strategists, organizers, and lawyers that are on the front lines of the battle to ensure that everyone's vote counts and that every vote is counting. Thank you for joining us. Now I'd like to introduce one of the co-founders of Black Voters Matters Fund and who you just heard at the beginning of this program, Latasha Brown. Latasha, how are you doing? Latasha is an award-winning visionary thought leader, institution builder, cultural activist, as we just heard, and connector. She is a nationally recognized go-to expert in black voting rights and voter suppression, black women's empowerment, and philanthropy. Her voice is the nexus between the civil rights movement, the black power movement, and the Black Lives Matter movement. Latasha co-founded Black Voters Matters Fund and Black Voters Matters Fund Capacity Building Institute to boost voter registration and turnout in order to increase power to marginalize predominantly Black communities. Welcome again, Latasha. Good to see you. I was looking at yes. that picture and I was like, wow, that was 20 years ago. Yeah, you know, Latasha and I met the summer of 2004, right, Latasha? The summer of 2004. I was actually 
Yes, I temporarily relocated to Atlanta to take part in a voter protection initiative called Count Every Vote that was organized by Linda Burnham, a good friend, and uh, uh, Keith Jennings. Uh, And we had some very good memories of that work and the work in seven southern states in training people how to monitor elections using international standards. So it's good to be back in partnership with you, Latasha. It is great to be back in partnership with you as well. You know, people may recall that came right after. It was really uh, another um, effort to really be able to deal with voter suppression that came right after the Bush-Gore debacle that happened in Florida. Um, And in response to that, we came together, led by Linda Burnham and Dr. Keith Jennings, um, and he brought us together, he brought a team together, included Gerald and myself, which is like, as you said, Gerald, how we met, you know, to really be able to address that, that one of the things that we could do is really be able to train people how to be election monitors and that we would be election monitors and that instead of just passively allowing these elections to continue to be stolen, um, that there would be some voter protection, an added level of voter protection and communities would be trained on what to do um, and how, what to look for. And we did that in seven states. And we also did a lot of kind of educating, flying around California, back and forth to California and other states really talking about this issue. You know, Gerald, as I as I think about that moment, this was in 2004. So we're in 2020. We're 16 years later. You know, and as I think about that, this moment, you know, it, even at the at that time, I thought that that was something related to um, the administration that was in. I don't yeah. know that I would have envisioned that we would be where we are right now. That it would it not yeah. at least. Not only not get a little bit better, but fundamentally it's actually gotten worse in many, many, many yeah. circles, many ways. So how are you reading this historical junction in comparison to the past eras of voter suppression? What's similar and what's different, Natasha, in your opinion? You know, I think that there's a I think when the political landscape changes, everything changes. I think what has happened is that, you know, democracy was a cool concept, you know, as long as there were those that were in power. Um, could see themselves maintaining that power, that once we see the browning of America, we know that America is slated by 2050 to be a majority non-white country. Um, And I think that there are people who have literally maintained um, the white power base and really for themselves. I think they've been exploitive to to other white citizens um, for their own Mm -hmm. power. But I think with that, I think that has changed the trajectory of the... uh, of the, the, the political landscape. And yeah. I think what we're seeing is we're seeing more aggressive behavior by those bad actors who want to, who really don't fundamentally believe in democracy, nor have they ever believed in democracy, right? And so I think it's been, it's been taken to scale. I think what we saw, and I think we, Gerald, that's what, you know, a lot of the work that we worked on, what we talked about, you know, that I think on some level, people even thought it was a regional issue. I remember we were at one of the colleges in California talking about it, and it just seemed unconscionable, some of the voter suppression pieces that we were raising, and yeah. look at where we are now, yeah. right? And and so I think that there's a couple of things. So I think, one, there's a shift because of the demographic shift. I think that there is a political shift. You know, if even if I'm thinking about from the work in 2004 to even now, um, we didn't have 2013. You, we had this landmark case, Shelby versus Holder, which was the Voting Rights Act, um, the stripping of the Voting Rights Act that took out preclearance clause. And so, yeah. at least the, the, the basic protection mechanisms that were in the Voting Rights Act have been stripped out. Um, so, we know that. You know, I think that that has changed the landscape as well. The third thing I think that has changed the landscape um, has been around. You know, there is a, in, in, in the last this last election cycle, there's been a shift of who is the voting base, right? That the majority up until this election, this will be the first election that the baby boomers actually don't ha- are not the largest constituency base. Now, they were mm-hmm. probably both the lot highest. But up until this time, because the baby boomers, because of their population, they just had a population advantage over all of the generations, including Generation X, which I find myself in. Um, they The baby boomers could dominate the political um, uh, political landscape. 
actually young folks um, from Generation Z on down really are the largest constituency base now. So they find, they've eclipsed the baby boomers. So I think that that can have a significant change on the political landscape going forward. You know, it's a question yeah. of how we engage that population, how that population is supported and their leadership as we go forward. And so, and then I also think that things have come to a head. Um, so much has happened, I think, just in the last decade. So much has come to a head, you know, uh, with having the first African-American pro- uh, president. You know, on one on the surface, it was like that happened. But we're literally, there's never been Black progress in this country. And there's not been white backlash. And so I think we're we're all still dealing with the backlash of electing a black president. And so I think, you know, Trump came into power as as a result of that, as a result of some other things. And I think there's some social norms, political norms that we've been saying, you know, there's there needs to be stronger protections. Right. And I think that some of that has um, been exposed. I think the fragility of democracy has been exposed. Um, And so we're really in this interesting moment. Gerald, I think we're in. um, the perfect storm. We've got this interesting moment that all those things that America um, has hidden itself through is American exceptionalism saying, oh no, that's not us, we're a democracy. Oh no, we're a wealthy, um, civilized country. Oh no, we have human rights, we're better than everybody else on that. You know, um, no, we have a, a balance of power. We're literally seeing this in real time. Um, We're seeing the holes holes in that right and we're seeing the unraveling yeah so let me ask you this so what do you think the impact then of the of this massive black uh black lives matter movement is is having on uh on voting on particularly among black folks but across the spectrum of, of communities you know it what's really interesting is that if we look at in the last few months, there were uprisings related to the Black Lives Matter movement in all 50 states. The character to that movement, though, was astounding. And it was multiracial. It was multi-generational, right? In all 50 states, we have never seen, there's never been an uprising on that level and that scale that has been documented in this country. That in itself says something. That says that, you know, there has been, that movement has has set root. And we didn't just see it in America, that even as people were protesting here, we saw a protest from Hong Kong to England to um, the Caribbean to France, all across standing in solidarity. And so what, what I think the Black Lives Matter movement has done is I think there's a shaping of literally is pulling the covers back and the curtains back and saying, no, we're not just going to like step over this. We're not going to just step over racial injustice, but we're committed in the long haul that just in standing in the space that we have got to fundamentally face racism in this country. And I don't know if we've had a sustained movement in this country to really be able to do, to be um, that focused in some senses around this notion of race, anti-Black racism, like literally calling it, naming yeah. it, and organizing it around it. Yeah. So talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in Georgia, because we know that Georgia is one of the ground zero places for voter suppression. Ooh. So talk about what's going on. And, that would be a, that and would be a whole the, session itself. I'm going to see if I can... Um, <laughs> change. I don't know what the, the internet service is really bad. I, it seems like it's really choppy here, so I apologize. Um, no, you're coming along fine. You sound good. Okay. Okay. So I, you know, in Georgia is, is, is a whole just hot mess, as I don't have any other way to say it, Gerald, that recently we just had a press conference on yesterday, um, Cliff and I, because we are partnering with um, Greg Palace, who delivered a report to the ACLU um, about a week ago. And on last, yesterday, we had a press conference really talking about this report where there are 200,000 voters right now. And and I'm going to talk about voter suppression, but let me tell you what we're facing right now. There are 200,000 voters right now that have been dropped off the voting rolls that should have never been dropped off of the voting rolls. That literally what we, and it gets better, the story gets better, that in, in October of 2019, the Secretary of State Raffensperger, 
um, actually dropped these, it was over 300,000, 320,000 voters saying that they no longer had valid addresses. And as a result, he kicked them off the, the voting rolls. He was kicking them off the voting rolls. And so um, when there was a, a investigative journalist, um, Greg Palace, along with a body of experts who do, who do data analysis, they do data mining and they do hygiene, data hygiene, work for major companies like, like Amazon and, and Apple and those companies um, that really like depend on having good, clean data that he hired and brought those experts on in. They looked at the data and immediately found something was wrong. The first thing that they noticed that was 60,000 names. They just didn't make sense. They couldn't understand where was where the information was coming from, that there were bad addresses because they actually were using over 200 different sources to check these addresses. And what they came back with um, is that when you look at what was certified, that like those addresses never should have been kicked off. And so there was like 60,000, which led them to even look a little deeper. And then fundamentally, they ran the test twice. You know, they did a, a complete like data hygiene, which, like I said, large companies do and pay millions of dollars for it, um, to make sure that they get the best update, most updated and clean data. And they discovered that it's almost it was one hundred and ninety eight thousand. I can't remember the exact number, but close to um, uh, people who are on that list that fundamentally are should not never been dropped that there's no evidence that they had moved or any evidence that um, they were not still there. Matter of fact, um, they even called some of them. They called uh, 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 some of some of the folks that were there to see, and it was like, no, I've never moved. So they were trying to figure out, well, how did you all get on this list? So ultimately, in the, the National Voting Rights Act requires that you have a licensee, that if you're going to drop um, people from the voting rolls, that one of the things that you need to do is have a license, a licensee that works with the uh, um, um, work for the United States Postal Service. They have a licensee, a third party who actually does um, data hygiene, right, to make mm-hmm. sure that the data like is clean and updated. And it's by law you're supposed to have that, right, so that you're not just going by a change of address because that may or may not be accurate, but you have the most accurate list. And so the, all up until yesterday, the assumption was we were asking, the assumption was that the secretary of state just didn't want to release who his licensee was. That and, and it was our experts would sit down with his experts to figure out how could it be so wrong? Like 200,000 people, that's a medium sized city in America. How could it be so wrong? Um, it was discovered yesterday in an interview with CNN that the secretary of state admitted to CNN reporter that they didn't have a licensee. Not only is it legal that they dropped the the, the, the 200,000 people, he didn't even follow the basic, basic protocol of what the National Voting Rights Act says that he has to do. There's never been a licensee. I'm actually in utter shock, right? I am in some ways I'm not, but in some ways I am. And so, you mm-hmm. know, so in Georgia right now, we're having 2,000 people that we're demanding get on the voting rolls right now um, that never should have been taken off in the first place. But then he can't, he didn't even, even if he were going to take, even if he was going to take them off, he didn't even go through the process that is dictated by law to make sure to justify taking them off. And that's just how what we're seeing an abuse of power. Um, that yeah. was just in, two, that's 2019. But what we can do is we can go back from 2018. We can even come forward here um, where when we're talking about standing in lines, we're talking about the closing, the massive closing of polling sites, when we're talking about how in terms of registrations, that many of the registrations, the Brenda Center came up with, had a report that came out about two months ago. They talked about those states who were covered in the Voting Rights Act. When you look at those states and you look at the national average of people who have been dropped from the voting rolls, that the states that have been covered by the Voting Rights Act on on, on the preclearance clause had been covered by the preclearance clause, that is a 40% rate higher than the national average in those states. So something is happening that is almost a 50 percent different than the rest of the states um, um, after the Voting Rights Act. And in addition to that, we're also seeing in Wisconsin on this coming Tuesday. Right. There is a one hundred and twenty nine thousand voters. The majority of them are African-Americans and students that will be dropped from the voting rolls. Actually, the state, which is a Democratic administration in, in, in office right now, the state does not want to drop those voters. But the Republican administration, right before they went out of office this last election cycle, um, there's a group called WHEEL, uh, this legislative body that's really a Republican special interest group. 
um, decided that they are pushing to force the current government to strike off 129,000 people, majority African-Americans and students before this election cycle. And the state government itself is actually fighting to keep those people on the roll. So when we're talking about voter suppression, we're fighting that issue on every single level. We really have to recognize how egregious what is happening right before our eyes where there is an unraveling of democracy. Yeah. So let me see if there's any questions from folks that are tuning in to us. So do we have any uh, questions from, from the viewers? If not, we can go uh, to further talk to you about what you are doing about all that. I know you're operating in not just Georgia, but several other states. Can you talk about your uh, your work in across the South and other states that you're working in? Yes. So in 2016, when Cliff and I started Black Voters Matter, one of the things that we were committed to is helping to build the capacity of Black-led grassroots groups all around the South in particular. But what we are, what you're looking at right now is what we call the Blackest Bus in America. Um, Matter of fact, the the, the photo that you all see that's popped up now is actually from Kentucky. It's from Louisville, Kentucky. We worked this last election cycle there, where in in a county, that's another interesting space, that in a county of where 50% of the black population live in that area. What we saw is normally in that county there's 370 polling sites. This last election cycle, there was one. One polling site to serve 612,000 people. Um, mm-hmm. We see this everywhere we go, these kind of egregious acts. So what we've decided to do and why we created the organization was to help build the capacity of Black-led grassroots groups all around um, all around the country. We're working in 11 states that with our Black Voters Matter Capacity Building Institute, what we do is we provide resources directly to Black-led groups that are doing power building work on the ground. The resources come in the form of grants and money directly. Also, also in terms of tools from text messaging to phone banking tools, also in terms of helping them with from materials from, as you see, from church fans to T-shirts to flyers, everything that a campaign would provide so that there's an identity um, that as people are doing work, that people can connect to that message. And we do a lot of work around narrative shift because we think it's really important around the narrative of who Black voters are, what it is that we want, and literally shifting the narrative of our power. And so we run campaigns really to be able to to galvanize communities around tapping into their own power and building out an agenda that is really local in local um, in that local community. So instead of every four years when there's a presidential election, what we know is that when you really feel power is at the bottom, it's hard to get people excited about the presidential uh, election when they've lost control of their school board or their county commissioner or their mayor's office. And so our work is really rooted in helping to build local power, be able to build out the ecosystem of groups that are doing this work so that we can have greater impact on the local, state, and the national level. Natasha Brown, thank you so much for this conversation. I know you're going to rejoin us a little later. Uh, So I want to say goodbye to you now, and uh, we'll talk later. We're going to bring in the other panelists to have a broader discussion about voter suppression. In just a minute, we'll be joined by Cliff Albright from Black Voters Matters Fund, Judith Brown Deanna's from Advancement Project, Brianna Brown from Texas Organizing Project, and Desmond Mead from the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. All are doing work around voter suppression in different states and nationally in organizing to make sure that this vote is not suppressed in any of our communities. Cliff Albright is one of the co-founders of Black Voters Matters Fund, and he has led 13 primarily southern states in the blackest bus in America that we saw the video of, energizing voters and exposing voters' suppression. 
He hosts a weekly radio show in Atlanta, and he has served as an instructor of African-American studies at several universities. Cliff previously lived in historic Selma, Alabama, where he focused on bringing financial resources to Alabama's Black Belt region. Welcome, Cliff. And we also have Judith Brown Deanis, uh, the executive director of the Advancement Project National Office. Judith has served as a lawyer, professor, and civil rights advocate for more than two decades in the movement for racial justice. Hailed as a voting rights expert and pioneer in the movement to dismantle the school-to-prison pipeline, Judith leads the Advancements Project's national office in combating structural racism in education, voting, policing, criminal justice, and immigration. Welcome, Judith. And we have Brianna Brown. Brianna is the deputy director of the Texas Organizing Project. With more than a decade of experience working in the social justice movements on issues ranging from ex-offender reenfranchisement to immigration reform, Brianna focuses on building a bomb staff and membership that centralizes the experience of black folks and Latinos as deputy director of the largest grassroots community-based organization in Texas. She is a proud fourth-generation Texas and founding board member of the African American Center on Global Politics and Human Rights. Welcome, Brianna. And finally, we have Desmond Mead, the executive director of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. As a formerly homeless returning citizen and now executive director of the, the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, he has led a historic victory in 2018 with the passage of Amendment 4, restoring voting rights to over 1.4 million Floridians with past felony convictions. So I don't know if Desmond is with us yet. He had a press conference, but he will be joining us soon. We can start and he can join us. So a question to our panelists, can we bring up all the panelists? If I do, there's going to be a... So maybe we can ask these panelists one by one until uh, Desmond comes. Here we go. Thank you. So just to start off, how are you all reading the Black Lives Matter movements uh, in the streets and, and the impact on the conscience of black folks, not only to protest racism and white supremacy, but to show up at the ballot box? You want to take that, uh, Judith? Sure. Well, um, first, thank you for having me. It's good to be here with um, some incredible people because um, I need to be with incredible people right now because <laughs> we are hurting. Um, so I, I think that we, we have to connect to the moment that we are in to November 3rd for several reasons, is that we know that building political power in Black communities um, doesn't just start with protesting, nor does it start with the ballot box. It is that we have to organize, we have to protest, and we have to vote, and that we have to connect the dots. Today, we are um, grieving again another insult and injury to Black people um, in the decision, the ju grand jury decision in Louisville uh, around the murder of Breonna Taylor, um, something that we should have predicted because this system continues to show us that Black lives do not matter to the system and that the system was built this way. But the thing that we also have to know is that we have been making wins and right. So this moment that we're in and young people taken to the streets and not so young people and our elders taken to the streets has given us some wins. We're having a different conversation. We're winning some policies. We're getting police departments um, not fully defunded, uh, but we're getting cuts in budgets and more money put into our communities. We're seeing movements 
win on police free schools around the work like that advancement project is. And so we know that we have to connect what our community needs and our lives and our ability to build power and connect that to November 3rd. Because on November 3rd, not only is there a presidential race, but there are sheriff's races. In Georgia, for example, there are more than 150 sheriff's races in the state of Georgia. In Florida, there are more, there are 66 sheriff's races. And so it's our opportunity to use voting as a tactic to be able to build and hold our power so that we can see the change that we want, the radical transformation that we need in this criminal legal system starts with us and it moves through November, but then we don't end there. We got to keep doing the work. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Cliff, what are you thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement and the impact on your work? Yeah, I just really want to start off just by, you know, echoing everything Judo said, including thank you for organizing this and putting together such a great a great panel. I'm always glad to be on with some, some old friends and new friends that are doing amazing work. But yeah, I just want to echo everything that Judah said. I mean, um, you know, we were already seeing, you know, we don't even have to really speculate about what the potential impact will be because we've already seen it. We've already seen record turnout in just about every state that has had primaries taking place. Uh, ever since the, the movement started, the protest started, um, we're seeing record turnout, you know, uh, in, in Kentucky, in Michigan, in, in Georgia. Um, we're seeing record turnout in states after the presidential primary really was no longer a contested primary. You know, we're, mm. seeing, we're seeing record turnout in states even where there's, there's really no statewide, um, you look at the state of Michigan and there was really no competitive statewide race and yet we still see record turnout. And so, um, so we're already seeing what the impact of this is. Some of that is, you know, record turnout and energy that just comes from, you know, four years of, of fascism, right? Uh, but some of that is, is record turnout that's coming because of, directly related to the energy that we've seen in the streets because of uh, the movement around police violence and the movement for black lives. And so, you know, and, and even when you look at some of the surveys that have been done, where they've talked to, you know, predominantly younger voters um, or, or others that have been involved in the protests, when they go to folks that have been involved in these protests and ask them, are you now more likely to vote? You're seeing in, in all of these polls across the board that the answer is yes. And so you're, 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 you're seeing all of this energy that has already shown up, um, not just showing up in city council meetings and getting some of these city councils and board of education to start doing some of these policies, but you're seeing it at the polling place. And we believe that we're just going to continue to see it between now and November. Now, none of that is is automatic, right? That's the result of work, you know, work of protesters, work of, of organizations that are usually in the electoral space that have found ways to really merge these two worlds, you know, this, this merger of the protest politics and the electoral politics. Those two things have to go together. And the truth is, when we've been at our best those things have always gone together. We've always used the combination of strategies of protest and electoral, of protest and, and, and legal, right? You know, I, I tell people all the time, you know, I used to live in Selma with, along with Latasha, uh, used to live in Selma, Alabama, right? We didn't vote for the Voting Rights Act in Selma. We had to protest to lead to that historic act. And so these two strategies have always gone together. This is nothing new. We have to put that in that proper historical context, and then we have to add on, you know, what 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 our contribution um, to that mix is going to be in this moment that we're in right now. And so I'm incredibly optimistic about the energy and the turnout that we're seeing. The only thing that could potentially hold it back is this issue that we've been talking about, which is this issue of voter suppression in all of its forms and, and shapes. I hear that, brother. Brianna. What's going on on the ground in Texas? Yeah, you know, um, I'm going to be an echo's echo, right? Um, you know, we're the largest grassroots organization in Texas that is doing exactly uh, what folks, you know, have already talked about, which is this kind of like inhale and exhale, right? Organizing in the streets 24-7 and then matching that with electoral might. Um, you know, this year we're talking to a record number of 1.6 million voters of color, mostly Black and Latino. 
Um, and the goal is to have really good organizing with co conversations with folks so that yes, you're inspired to vote in this election. And to the point that I've heard, and I just want to take a highlighter out on to, in, to inspire action after the election is over. Um, you know, uh, in Texas, I don't think that there's, I think it, it becomes surprising to some folks to learn that, you know, we're home to the second largest black population in the country. We got 3.6 million black folks driving the culture here. Uh, we're home to the second largest uh, registered voters, uh, black registered voters in the country, right behind our friends in Georgia. We got 1.8 million black folks that are registered to vote. We have another 700,000 of us who are eligible but not registered to vote. Um, so I think that conversations about like how are we collectively moving towards a vision of like black liberation you can't have that conversation without talking about texas um i am i don't you know i'm a blend of um being really optimistic uh in part because you know the proof has been in the pudding in some elections that we've had so far right um, we've had record turnout even here in, in Texas and in, in, during the primaries. Um, you know, what disheartens me, uh, I, I'm based in um, Dallas County and the city of Dallas is soon to take a vote on uh, some of the, the, the our, our campaign around defunding the police. Uh, you know, we called for $200 million uh, to be uh, slashed. Um, and we had over, you know, we had a hundred people testifying over Zoom. We had, you know, people in the streets, hundreds, 100 days of protest. Uh, and those calls have really fallen on deaf ears, right? Um, that locally, uh, we haven't built the kind of power on the city council uh, and the movement outside agitating that we can really um, impact and, and make sure that policies are materially impacting our lives. So, I, to me, it, there's a cautionary note about, yes, we got to get folks like energized and inspired to vote, right? To me, it's not coincidental that, uh, you know, some of us opt out of voting because we're not courted to vote. And then there's these questions of how we've been structurally disenfranchised. Um, so we absolutely have to do that work. And we absolutely have to continue to make investment in that um power building infrastructure that Latasha talked about to make sure that the day after the election that we are ready to go with an agenda um, and that you know we're not going anywhere, right? Definitely not going anywhere. <laughs> Cliff, what's going on? You had a question for the panel? Are you are you queued up to uh, co-moderate yeah. with us? So, yeah, I think the, you know, the, the question would be, um, we've seen all the stories around vote by mail, right? That's the, the elephant in the room, right? You know, we're in the midst of this pandemic. You know, we've got um, um, an election that's going to be largely be by mail. We know that the person in the White House has been attacking the Postal Service, attacking the very concept of voting by mail. We know that he's got a crony running the, the postal system. Uh, we've seen all the stories about the delays. Uh, what do you all think is going to be the impact of this, um, this, these attacks on vote by mail? And, you know, what kind of strategies do we need to be considering to, to counter those attacks? And I'll start I'll with, um, yeah, I'll go on, go on, Judith. Yeah, I was just going to say all good questions, Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. Uh, so... <laughs> So this is part of the game, right? Um, every election cycle, we see new tactics around voter suppression. And one of the tactics that's always used is disinformation and misinformation. Um, those who don't want black and brown people to vote um, because they wanna maintain power do come up with these kind of myths, right? Like we were, vo we were fighting the voter fraud myth in 2011 and, and 2012, and in part, that was because if they could create that, then they could have the basis for, for requiring voter ID, knowing that black and brown people did not have access to voter ID like white folks did. And so here we are, you know, flash <laughs> forward, fast forward to 2020 and this whole issue around vote by mail. Now, vote by mail has worked 
for a long time for a lot of people who are use who use absentee ballots. It works for um, for our people in military, people who live overseas. Uh, it worked for Trump himself as he votes by mail from D.C. And so this is really a tactic. And so I would say this is that it is a tactic of misinformation, but there are, I also wanted people to know that there are concerns. When you you go the extra step of not only the disinformation, but then actually try to dismantle the United States Postal Service so that it becomes a tool of voter suppression, we got another, we've got another game on our hands. And so I would say that what's really important is that voters know the rules of the road. Um, understand, make a plan for voting, that for those who cannot show up at a polling place, because, you know, polling place, it's not just election day, but it's the early voting period. So we need to stretch out our people, um, you know, make sure they're showing up for the early voting uh, if they can. But the thing is, no one should have to choose between their health and their right to vote. And so if you have to uh, vote by mail or do an absentee ballot, get that piece that that your ballot in the mail. Um, Many states are allowing for drop off boxes. So if you don't feel comfortable putting in the mail because you need to put in the mail, you know, far enough in advance, make sure that joker gets there, make sure watch them do the postmark if you can. Uh, put it in the mail. But then the other thing is to follow up. If you do vote by mail, you have to follow up, make sure, track your ballot, make sure that it gets counted. And if there's a problem, there's actually a period of time where you can fix the problem. It's usually three days in most states. Um, But the other thing is that um, you should make sure that if you can show up at the polls, and if that's what you really want to do, that you do that. If you have vote by mail, many states have drop-off boxes. Some of them They're putting them all over the place, some of them just at election officials, um, offices. So just make a plan. Know the way that you feel most comfortable with um, voting, but don't put yourself at risk. Brianna, any any thoughts from you? What what are y'all seeing there? And I know here in Georgia, we've already seen, I think the last uh, count we had was 1.1 million folks that have already uh, requested the ballots, you know, faster than the pace we were on for our primary. You know, what are, what are you all seeing there in Texas? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, when Natasha described what's going on in Georgia with voter suppression as a hot mess, I just wanted to amen that because, you know, Texas, uh, you know, there is a buffet of hot messness <laughs> that you can choose from when it comes to voter suppression. Um, the, you know, we are one of six states uh, in the nation that has refused, you know, even before pandemic, pre, just as another structural tactic to, to keep us from voting, has refused to expand vote by mail or any kind of remote voting options. Uh, so recently, uh, you know, we were part of an organizing effort in Harris County in Houston. Um, Harris County is where Houston is uh, to get that county commissioner's court to uh, send a vote by mail application to all eligible voters in Harris County. Harris County has 2.5 million eligible voters. Um, And that was following uh, a decision by a federal court that said that if people wanted to, people um, had the agency to uh, make a claim around disability if they felt vulnerable um, going to the polls uh, due to COVID. Um, So um, our, really, uh, you know, our our commissioner's court in in Harris County that we fought to make sure we had a progressive commissioner's court there, right, that we had the votes we needed in order to win these kind of like material policies, Um, voted to make sure that everyone, those 2.5 million people could get access to a ballot. Then we have our uh, attorney general come in, attorney general PS, uh, that has been under indictment for the last five years and hasn't quite made it to trial yet. Um, you know, uh, sue Harris County. And so they retracted that uh, and just said that they were going to send vote by mail ballots to folks who were 65 and older, which is uh, just, you know, what has had been the course, um, you know, previously. Uh, So uh, part of the part of telling that story is um, one of the necessity, again, that the ballot box is not the panacea and like really figuring out what is the agenda that we have post game to figure out what is the prescription we need so that we can not only participate at the ballot box uh, to do this point, to do it in a way that we can protect ourselves, stay alive, 
Um, but then how do we continue like real engagement, you know, post-election? Um, I think that those are, that's a critical question for us as organizers that are doing, you know, this inhale and exhale of mobilizing people in the streets every day of the year, and then also inspiring folks to the ballot box. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions from uh, people who are viewing this. Mad Mark asks, uh, what advice do you have for people who are worried that they might have been purged from voter rolls? Mm -hmm. And then Mia Brooks asks, how can we get more involved on community engagement level? Where to get the funds from? Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> so I'll take the little per the per the little per I didn't mean the little purge question, but the purge question because purging is it ain't too little um, <laughs> because we know that hundreds of thousands of people have been taken off the rolls through um, through purging and really aggressive purging practices um, by election officials and so um, what we suggest is that. Um, you know, as we're registering people and saying you need to register, that those of us who are registered, you need to check your status <laughs> um, because we know that too many people will show up to the polls. And let's say you haven't voted in, in two elections, um, that your name may not be there or that you've moved. You move from one state to another or, you know, that I mean, there's there's trickery that happens, too. And so check your voter registration status. Ain't, none of us are safe from voter suppression. And so that is something that you should do by going on your Secretary of State's website um, or your County Board of Elections to just check your status uh, to make sure that you are still on the rolls and active. And the second question about uh, how to get engaged on the grassroots level Oh my God. Oh, I got really excited when I heard that. I don't know if you're about to dish it somewhere, but I'm just, there is such an amazing network of organizations across this country that are doing this kind of power building. Um, you know, if you are in Texas, you should come to Texas Organizing Project. But there are so many organizations that are, you know, um, one of the things that Latasha was saying was like really funding like black led organizing that's going on the ground. Um, I think it's been really interesting since the uprisings. Um, I think you know, one way I think about them is, is kind of as a Vicks vapor rub, right? Like there's a different kind of openness and people are trying to figure out where is it that they can plug in? Yes, we got to vote. And um, literally wherever you are, whatever state you live in, I mean, I will put my email address up for you to email me and I will get you connected to <laughs> the really bomb organizing that is going on. Uh, in your state, um, because there, there is such a rich and beautiful network that is doing this work, that's coordinated, that's strategic, um, and uh, and doesn't work unless there are folks that are that are driving the work. Right? That's that's the fuel. So also on that point, uh, if you go to Rise Up for Justice, the number four, riseupforjustice.org. There is a list of resources that include groups from across the country that are doing work around voter engagement, voter suppression, get out to vote. Cliff, you had something else to add? Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna cheat a little bit, use a, a little moderator, co-moderator privilege. Um, you know, on the on both of those questions, you know, uh, on the, the first one, um, you can go to, you know, sites like vote.org. Or even like our organization, we have a page that's actually using vote.org tools so that you can get registered, check your registration status, um, even request your vote by mail ballot. And so I would say take a look at you know groups or sites like vote.org or our page, blackvotersbatterfund.org slash vote. And you, you have those links right there. Of course, you could always go to your own state, your secretary of state's page, whatever it is, but just in terms of like having one generic page that you can go to, um, those are a couple of resources. And then on this second question of like how groups can get some of this funding, you know, one of the things that's, you know, we heard over the past past few days ever since uh, um, Justice Ginsburg died about the increase in funding that's been going to some of these candidates or going to the Democratic Party, you know, part of the answer, definitely look at the, the, the resources, the page that Gerald mentioned, definitely get in touch with organizations like Texas 
organizing project. Part of the reason we created Black Voters Matter Fund was so that we could help deal with this issue. We literally created this organization so that we could get resources to folks on the ground that are doing this incredible work, at least in the, in the target states where we do our work. But the other thing is this, you can go to some of these um, institutions, you can go to the party, you can, you can even demand of candidates, right, that they release some of this funding because there's, there's nothing worse than just putting a whole lot of new money, millions and millions of dollars into campaigns that are gonna run bad strategy. They're just going to be running more, uh, more, more television commercials that nobody's really going to pay attention to, particularly the voters that you really got to reach out to, right? So you got, but you got folks on the ground, you know, that that know how to get this work done and know how to reach the folks that we're trying to reach, and so we can demand from some of the places that have um, have these resources that they free it up because they're not going to do right by it anyway. So get rid of it. Give it to us. Give it to the local <laughs> groups. Give it to the, the neighborhood association, right? Give it to um, whoever. Give it to top, right? And so um, we can make that that demand of them so to, to literally help them um, to save them from themselves. Can I just, I just wanted to add just on the resources that um, you can also come to advanceofproject.org. Um, we do have resources that are really for like organizations to take and run with that are like, you know, information about how uh, vote by mail will work in particular states. We also have information like messaging, et cetera, that we have um, we have tested through polling and um, focus groups. Uh, so there are resources that are available to organizations to just like plug and play and keep running with it. Thank you for that. I, I wanna ask the question about uh, your strategies and tactics. So how are you, uh, both in the organizing and the legal realms, uh, dealing with voter suppression and getting out the vote. And also, how are you dealing with trying to bridge the social and political uh, differences and divides between different racial groups, particularly the Black and Black next communities, Black and white communities, Black women, white women? How are you? What is your organizing strategies and your legal strategies? Uh, for get out the vote and for uh, countering voter suppression. Cliff, what do you think? What's up? So, yeah, so we're doing, we're, we're trying a couple, a bunch of different strategies, right? Uh, uh, you know, one of the strategies that we use is what Latasha talked about earlier, is even just in terms of, of the, our presence and going around and doing our bus tours in the blackest bus in America, which I don't know if she mentioned it, it's no longer just the blackest bus in America, now it's the blackest fleet in America because we've added a whole <laughs> bunch of what we call baby buses um, to the fleet, these 15 passenger vans that are going to be roaming around within the states where we do our work, the 10 states where we do our work. And so, but the, that comes out of, it's, it's not just about the energy and the excitement and the motivation, right? It's, it's also very practical because we're trying to find ways to get some of the same contact, to share some of the same information, to do some of the same souls to the polls and things of that nature, but being able to do it in a way that's more socially distant, to be able to even do do big rallies like, you know, we're, we're hoping to do some, some big events even around some of the, the debates that are coming up, but even being able to do like, um, and we've done a few of these like, these parking lot uh, programs where you got, you know, dozens or hundreds of cars in a parking lot, almost like a, like a drive-in theater, right? And where you're able to like watch, watch, um, you know, watch some informational videos, some tutorials, some influencers, or watch a presidential debate or something like that, but be able to do it in a way that's socially distant and safe, but you're still able to feel each other's energy. You're still able to share information. You're still able to use QR codes. You know, our buses and vans have QR codes on them that'll take people directly to the pages where they can go to register to vote or request their vote by mail. So this this overall strategy, we're calling it our um, We Got Power campaign, uh, this overall caravan and bus and mobile strategy as a way of both, you know, energizing folks, but also sharing um, necessary information and literally taking people to the polling places, as Judith said, going down to the to the board of elections and, and casting your ballot, you know, so that you don't have to, what most people are afraid of isn't so much the mail system and getting their ballot. What most people are afraid of is after I get it and after I fill it out and I put it in the mail, 
you know, they're standing at the mailbox like, ooh, do I let it go? Because once I let it go, I don't know what's going to happen. And so what we're trying to let people know is we got power. In most of these states, you don't have to even return it by mail. You know, in, in most states, I know Tennessee is an exception. I'm not sure if there's other ones. But in most states, Tennessee, they force you. If you get it by mail, you got to return it by mail. But in most states, you can actually go on and walk it in or drive it in, right? And so we're, we're using these caravans even as a mechanism for having folks be able to do that. And so those are, those are some of the ways um, that we're, we're, and all of that goes towards fighting against the suppression, the attacks against the male. Um, and the caravans even play a role in just letting people know that you're not alone. Because when you, when you see one of these big old buses or vans rolling through, you best believe that if there's some suppression going on, we're going to find it. We're going to expose it. We're going to talk about it in the national media. You know, we're going to do videos on it um, because that's that's the part of how this suppression thrives. It thrives in the darkness. And so we have a, a belief that if we show up, if we're in the right places where this takes place and we show up and we expose it um, and let people know that they're not alone and we're not isolated. That's another way that we're, we're trying to fight the suppression. Yes. Brianna, what's happening with top? What strategies and tactics are you all using? Uh, well, one of the things that uh, we're always very conscientious of is, um, you know, to some of the points that have been made before about the necessity to be like power building on the ground and institution building on the ground. So, you know, our whole organization doesn't get consumed by the election or a, the election, a election um we maintain our organizing. Uh, I mentioned before in Dallas today, uh, we're gearing up for a vote with the city council. Uh, you know, we asked for 200 million from the, from the police budget. Looks like they're going to do seven, right? Um, we are hard. We are, and, and with the, the new folks that we're engaging on these defund campaigns, we're having a twin conversation with them, right? We're talking about the issues and we're talking about how to link those issues to the ballot box. But organizing is the start of that conversation. In Harris County and in, in Bear County, where San Antonio is, uh, we've been participating in some amazing, uh, you know, action, direct actions to save people from getting evicted. Um, you know, it's gonna, the, the, the story around evictions that's gonna be unfolding, unraveling you know, the, in the next coming months uh, is tragic and gonna hit folks of color, black and Latinos in particular in Texas in a way that we've never seen. Um, so we are beefing up our organizing uh, in order to be able to, to, uh, to catch and hold uh, those communities and continue to fight and keep people in their homes. Um, so we, one of the tactics that we always use every year is to figure out like how do we maintain organizing first and foremost. Um, you know, like I said before, you know, we're running the biggest independent uh, get out the vote program in Texas this year, uh, 1.6 million <laughs> black and Latino folks. Um, and, you know, the way that we do that, uh, we have a, you know, family of organizations, our sisters organizations are going to, um, you know, be responsible for the program. And we're gonna be employing a lot of people uh, we make sure that those folks that are coming to us for a good paying job that has paid sick leave are also getting some political education. Because I think that that's an opportunity to figure out like how you got, we have these people for, you know, a three month time period, uh, not just to, you know, do the, the, the hard and critical work of moving folks to the, to the polls, uh, but can these folks become part of the crew? Can they be throwing down with us the day after the election? Uh, so, you know, we're also thinking about like how can in these elections um, and the, the folks that are coming to us um, in the elections be a part of the long-term organizing plan. Um, we have some plans to, you know, I was talking with one of our board members, Tangi. She called me up the other day and she was like, you know, our voters are going to be in a real pickle, right? She, she, she remembered the lines uh, from the primaries um, in March uh, that were wrapped around um, polling locations. Um, and she's like, we got to do something about it. So she had this brilliant idea around, you know, can we be doing some of the sending out safe voter kits? Folks are going to be coming directly from work. Uh, is there a respite we can provide for parents with, you know, for their kids? Can we keep people excited and joyful while they're in line, right, waiting to vote? Um, so we're gonna, our members are excited to be thrown down around a program that helps people kind of like smooth the edges of that day where you got to go or the, the days to do this point, right? It's not just a day. We got we gotta, <laughs> a period of early vote we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of. 
Um, so we're doing some of that work too. Um, and then the last thing I think that's really cool that we're doing uh, is partnering with uh, Black Citizenship in Action, part of Black PAC, uh, to talk with um, Black folks you know, across Texas about Black citizenship and how we got here, right? Um, so that people kind of feel that the ancestors behind them in the moment that's in front of us, you know, at the ballot box this year. Um, so those are some of the things that, you know, we're doing this year to, again, to, so to inspire folks to the polls. Right on. Yes. Judith, you have the last word. I'm afraid yeah. we're running out of time. And so uh, sure. we'd like to hear from you. Just uh, quickly, we are at Advance of Project. You know, we we do focus on the before the election because we know that local election officials make decisions that can impact the outcomes. And so we've been doing meetings with local election officials with our partners on the ground to make sure that voter suppression is not uh, being put in place before the election. The other thing that we are doing is that we're creating materials for the groups that do GOTV and civic engagement on um, the rules of the road around how to vote, whether it's vote by mail or in-person voting, so they can um, give that out to voters. And lastly, is that we are doing uh, a campaign, social media campaign targeted at 18 to 24 year olds. Black, uh, we did public opinion research of Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Asian 18 to 24 year olds, and the things that they cared about across the board COVID was number one, and number two was racial justice and policing. And so we are gonna be focusing on creating content that can be used to target 18 to 24 year olds, because we know that we're finding unity within um, that group across racial lines. Thank you so much, Judith, Brianna, Cliff. Uh, we appreciate your remarks. We're gonna move into the next section with Cliff and Natasha talking about the way forward. Thank you. Is Natasha back with us? So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and get started, you know, since we're talking about the way forward and the way forward is really about, you know, it's about us. You know, that's what we always say. Um, that's what we have on the back of our shirts and our push cards and our materials, you know, in spite of everything that we're going through um, that we've been through this year, you know, this, this, this year from hell. Right. Um, in spite of coronavirus, in spite of the police violence, in, including today's decision, um, you know, remarkable and yet not surprising decision um you know in spite of all of this at the end of the day we still have power we got power we got the power to deal with all these issues we got power to deal with the attacks on on the postal system we got power to deal with um you know the the, the failures of this coronavirus um you know we we got the power we, you know we we've been blessed enough to work with and support organizations all around this country that have been doing you know mutual aid programs in order to deal with um, the gaps in the coronavirus response that, you know, those that are supposed to have our best interests at heart have been dealt with. And so on all of these issues, the recurring theme is that we got power. Um, and so we got power to, to deal with this voter suppression. We've got power, as Judith said, to, to, to get engaged, to engage with these election officials, you know, officials that are making decisions over issues like, are there going to be drop boxes or will or not? Um, you know, what are the, what are the hours going to be for um, um, in-person voting or, or early voting, right? You know, some of these decisions have still been, have, have been made already, but some of these decisions are still yet to be made and we've got power to impact a lot of those decisions. We've got power to decide, you know, what ways we're going to uh, provide the support and the relief for folks who, for whatever reason, um, are not able to vote by mail or early vote or, or maybe just don't want to, right? Because we've got that in our community. We've got the tradition, the incredible tradition of folks that want to go vote in person, that, that want to go vote um, with their parents or with their children, right? And so, um, you know, we've got that tradition of, of folks, you know, folks who, who remember, you know, especially elderly folks who remember when they, they or their parents couldn't 
cast that vote and go in person. And so it's a it's a routine, it's a ritual, it's a tradition that people hold very near and dear. So there are gonna be some folks who can't um who, who can't early vote or vote by mail, and then there could be some folks that choose to wait and go go in person. But whatever the case is, we got power to make sure that our folks are able to do that safely, that they're not risking their lives if they do it, that we have access and we're giving out masks or we're giving out sanitizer or we're, we're doing the other things that we're doing, helping to keep people socially distant. And so we got power to, to do that. We got power to make sure that those lines aren't long by making sure that we've got enough poll workers, because that's also a part of the problem. That's also a part of this question, right? That that in the midst of this pandemic, um, that poll workers who usually are the older members of our communities, but for obvious reasons, they're not going to be able to be poll workers. We've already seen that happen during the during the primary season. We know that it's very likely to happen again in November, but we know this. And so we got power to deal with that issue, to recruit you know, younger folks in our communities to be poll workers, to spread the word about that. And so we, we, we got power to deal with even that issue. There is no issue of voter suppression facing us that we don't have the power to counteract. In fact, there's no issue facing us that we have not already counteracted and overcome. You know, so we got that power. And then, and then lastly, when all is said and done, after Election Day, as Brianna was talking about, the battle doesn't end there. Right. In fact, it's just the it's just the beginning of a new cycle of 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 the battle. Right. You know, what do we say? The past isn't dead. In fact, it's not even past. Even after Election Day, the battle hasn't stopped. We still have to be vigilant and we still have power to deal with all of the other um, issues of accountability, holding folks accountable, getting the changes that we need to get so that the next Election Day is not as problematic as this Election Day is shaping up to be. And so we've got the power to do all of that for the next 40 whatever days between now and November 3rd, but after November 3rd and into 2021 and 2020, there's no such thing as an off year. We've all got that power. And if we don't have the power to do anything else, right? If we don't, if we're not election specialists, if we don't know all the the laws, if we don't know all the ins and outs of voter purges and, and election monitoring, you know, if we don't, if we don't have all the ins and outs of, of PPE and providing masks or whatever, if nothing else, every single one of us has the ability to just spread the word. We tell people all the time, if you can do nothing else, if you can just t- touch five other folks, we've got our five friends pledge we always talk about. We say, go get your five and you go get your five. If everybody gets their five or gets their 10 or gets their 15, if we all just spread the word, what you know, spread that, that information video on like how to accurately vote by mail, you know, spread the word about, um, you know, about the need to, to, to vote early. Don't wait till election day. Don't wait for the deadlines to get registered to vote, like to do it today, to do it. So if we spread the word about the fierce urgency of now, if we just reach out, if we, if we, if we share information that we see on social media, if we send text messages to five or 10 of our friends and family, if you can do nothing else, you've got the power to touch somebody in your circle. I think I heard somebody. I don't know. So, so, so that's my, that's my call. That's my call to action, right? Is touch somebody, reach somebody, share some information with somebody, try to inspire somebody. But if you, if you can't do that, then share the information that can put them in touch with somebody else that might be able to, that might be able to deal with whatever the issues are that they're trying to see dealt with. We've all got, that power. We've all got a role to play in this process. I'm gonna pass it with that. I'm gonna pass it over to my my friend, sister comrade Latasha Brown. I think Cliff Albright has said all that needs to be said. To be honest, and at, that, at the end of the day, it's that's that's all that needs to be said. That we've got to actually organize around power. What I will tell people is. As part of the call, call of action is that we're doing a lot of this work. I'm going to say how you can be involved with Black Voters Matter. Um, if you can check us out on our website, there are a couple of things that you can do uh, with the work that we're doing. One, it is really important in this moment as we're talking about this conversation of power that you connect with organizations and have a political home um, of people who are doing this work. Um, and to reiterate what my brother said, this is all about we have to move beyond just participation about power. You can check us out. 
on www.blackvotersmatterfund.org. In addition to that, if you want to find information about what we're doing, text us, we matter to 797979. Um, you can also find us on social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram. We're constantly updating where we are, where the bus is going to be, um, the events that we're doing at Black Voters MTR. So make sure that you reach out to Black Voters MTR um, to follow us. And I think that that's the, 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 for the next month, we're going to, you're going to see, as Cliff said, the blackest fleet in America roam all around the streets of this country, really being able to encourage and inspire voters. So I'm just going to ask y'all to please reach out to us. Reach out to us, blackvotersmatterfund.org. Text, we matter to 797979. Um, keep in contact. We want to really be able, if even if in terms of voters, voters are trying to figure out their status or they need to register to vote, they can also go to our website, blackvotersmatterfund.org slash vote. They can check their status. You can actually get a voter registration form right there, or you can connect to some of the work that we're doing. So thank you all so much. This is all about when we're talking about black voters matter. We mean that black voters matter, not because we about participation, but because of power. We have power, and this is the moment to use it. So that brings us to the end of our program. I'd like to thank Latasha Brown and Cliff Albright of the Black Voters Matters Fund for co-sponsoring this event and for their rich contribution to the dialogue. Thanks to all of our speakers, Judith Brown Deannis of the Advancement Project, Brianna Brown from the Texas Organizing Project, and unfortunately Desmond Mead from the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition was not able to join us. Let me also thank the technical crew at We and Goliath who have done such a great job making sure we're online and we're technically correct. Let me also give a shout out to the staff of the Living Belonging Institute and the Black Voters Matters Fund who work behind the scenes to organize the event. I appreciate the team spirit and the collaboration. Today we are faced with a grave situation unprecedented in our history. We're confronted with the intersecting perils of COVID-19, the crisis in human relations precipitated and reinforced by structural racism and a white supremacist ideology, a global economic upheaval of economic, of epic proportions, and a profound political crisis in Washington and beyond. We are challenged to create something out of nothing, to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, as they say. But I say we can meet the challenge. The Black Lives Matter movement has reinvig reinvigorated our march to justice, freedom, and democracy, and many of the other social movements that are allied that have come alive in the 21st century have also shown maturity and growth. The immigrant justice movement, the women's movement, the climate justice movement, the LGBTQ plus movement, the indigenous rights movement, and of course the electoral justice movement. We have the opportunity at this inflection point in history to bring about a new cons consciousness, a new way of thinking about human relationships, the role of government ensuring that all of us belong, and a new conception of, of an economy and a healthcare system that works for all of us. The next hurdle towards the marathon that Nipsey Hussle rapped about is the 2020 elections. We have heard from our speakers about what has been done, what is being done, and what must be done to ensure that our people vote and that all votes are counted. It is up to us, all of us together, to bend the moral arc of the universe towards justice. With that, let me end with a poem that I wrote that is contained in my poetry book, United States of Struggle, Police Murder in America, that will be released next week. The poem is titled Day by Day, and I wrote it as a homage to the Black Lives Matter movement. Day by day, we rebel in peaceful confrontation. Day by day, we struggle for justice and affirmation. Day by day, we battle the forces of exploitation. And day by day, we challenge an imperfect nation. Day by day, we lift every voice and sing. 
Day by day, we demand, let freedom ring. Day by day, we make something out of nothing. Day by day, we transform our winter into spring. Day by day, we shatter all the false, false illusions. Day by day, we cut through the utter confusion. Day by day, we fight for belonging and inclusion. Day by day, we reach for a righteous solution. Day by day, we rise up and kneel on one wounded knee. Day by day, we step up and unmask bigoted brutality. Day by day, we stand up and renounce racist immorality. Until day by day, black lives matter and we are all free. Thank you very much for joining us.